imagine that one day you wake up and you read the news and what do you read? The internet, uh, as you know, it is broken. Classical cryptography that we use in our everyday lives, in our communication over the internet, is no longer secure and is threatened by quantum computers. This day, also known as uh, the quantum apocalypse or Y2Q, is it's not here yet, but it's bound to happen one day. And what could happen? Would you trust uh, the internet where you read about cryptography be broken, even though the internet itself is built of cryptography? Do you trust to go maybe online banking? Um, how do you know uh, what is true? Do you read the news? Um, what do you think would happen? Would it be maybe social unrest? Would people um, maybe go for a bank run because they want to have uh, all the cash in house? Our communication and our uh, online uh, encryption is becoming so vital for our everyday lives and for our uh, communication that if this will be broken, it will have disastrous consequences. It's so entwined with everything that we do all day, with the cars that open up, with the houses that we that we secure and where we live in and where we uh, where we where we communicate with people, in our work, in our banking, and whatever we do, we use of, of online technologies, and whatever we do, we use encryption. And if this will be broken, um, yeah, we uh, we it, there will be massive consequences. So this moment is not here yet. Um, we still have some time uh, before quantum computers are actually powerful enough to break cryptography, but it be it's becoming increasingly clear that this moment might happen one day. And I'm today to talk about that, you know, even though this might still take a couple of years, really the time to worry about this is today. So let me first take one step back and uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Julian van Velsen and I'm the head of Capgemini's Quantum Lab. And I'm here to talk today about this quantum threat, about Y2Q. Uh, sounds similar to Y2K maybe, um, but it's a massive, uh, much more bigger uh, threat um, and also with a lot of uncertainties. So as a step back, let me introduce quantum computers for those of you that don't know it. Quantum computers are this foundationally different computer than classical computers. And it's built on the, the principles of quantum physics, which we have uh, been studying for the past uh, 100 years. There are certain features in quantum physics that just don't exist classically. Things like superposition, the idea that particles can be in multiple states at the same time. Things like entanglement, uh, where uh, parties, particles are correlated to each other regardless of the distance. There was just recently a Nobel Prize for work in this area. And the idea about interference, which describes how particles can influence each other. None of these things exist in a classical computer. In a classical computer, we talk about bits and we talk about transistors and how currents go through a computer and we have logic gates and then we build some type of programming language. But in a quantum computer, this works just a little bit differently. Instead of bits, we have quantum bits or qubits, and they make use of these properties of superposition and interference and entanglement. And by doing so, we can have a computer that is from the foundation different, where we can have very uh, much more efficient algorithms than we could ever have on a classical computer. And so some examples include things like um, maybe quantum chemistry or material science, uh, where we could simulate some, some things like, for example, ground state energies or other types of, of properties that might be exponentially faster than a classical computer. So in other words, it might take a classical computer thousands of years, whereas a quantum computer might solve this just in hours. And this could have very good impact on the world. We could think about building new uh, materials for sustainable uh, change. We could think about, for example, catalysis or maybe batteries. Uh, we could think about developing new drugs. Maybe after that, we can also think about things like simulations, maybe computational fluid dynamics. Um, perhaps it could have an influence in the financial sector where we could think about uh, risk uh, management or even uh, pricing of financial products like derivatives uh, and many other applications. There's also one major application that has been envisioned already 30 years ago. And this algorithm is called Shor's algorithm, and it's there to break cryptography. So it's an, it's an algorithm that has an exponential speed up over classical computers, which means that 
a classical computer would take billions of years to calculate something what the quantum computer could do uh, potentially just in hours. Of course, you need the, the big enough quantum computer, powerful enough with enough uh, size to actually run this algorithm, and it's not there yet. But the technology is developing fast, and one day it will be. So the first and major, perhaps major question is, when is this quantum computer is there? If this is going to be such a massive uh, risk for our, for our everyday systems, we need to know how much time we have to prepare. And there are a lot of uncertainties around this in this area. It's very hard to say when exactly quantum computers will be big enough. Some estimates say that you know maybe there is an opportunity that it will be there in, in 2031, maybe five years later, maybe a few years earlier. And it's really about this, this uncertainty that, that people have to start thinking about. A large survey showed that in 2031, there could be a 50% probability of quantum computers breaking cryptography. So you got to ask yourself, what, what type of probability or what type of risk do I find acceptable? Is that 50%? Is that 10% probability? Perhaps 1%? In this survey also it showed that there's a 50% probability in 31, but a one in seven probability in 2026, only in a few years from now. And in fact, I gave a presentation lately to a group of uh, cybersecurity leaders and asked them, what do you find as a acceptable risk, 1%, 10%, 50%. And the vast majority said only 1% is acceptable. And that is around the corner. No one knows exactly uh, when quantum computers could be there. But if we only tolerate 1% risk, then I'm pretty sure we have to start thinking about it very soon. So given the quantum computers, have a probability of of being powerful enough, you know, in in the uh, in the in the very worst case moment, within the next decades, maybe within the next five years, we have to think about how do we start preparing and how much time does this preparation cost. Some systems take longer uh, time to to uh, to migrate to safer solutions. So let me break it down and give you some elements about what what do you have to think about and uh, about this this length of migration. One, system, one idea could be, what is the industry um, uh, infrastructure update cycle? How long does it take hardware to be in the field? So for example, cars. Cars have a shell of a uh, update cycle of perhaps, uh, perhaps 30 years, uh, perhaps 20 years. Um, and it might not, might not always be easy to upgrade cryptography, maybe because the chips that are used in those cars are um, uh, not replaceable and they just can't post newer types of encryption uh, maybe because it's um, uh, there's just so much software and it can't be updated over the air maybe for many other reasons um, what about other things what about a passport for example it might not be possible to operate cryptography there either uh, my passport is 10 years valid how long uh, do you want to um, how, how long in advance do you have to prepare uh, for new cryptography in passports so that's one element, the shelf time about hardware that is going to be in use. Another element is data shelf time. How long does data has to be relevant? In some situations, we might be able to re-encrypt data, but in many other cases, it might not be. For example, just because of the sheer size of the data or because it's uh, hosted at a client site or because it's uh, with customers or because for many other reasons, it might not be possible. And many of our data should be remaining sensitive or secured for, for a longer period of time. Think about maybe um, uh, maybe life insurances. Uh, think about signatures that are, are used. Think about code, code signing. Uh, think about um, uh, other sensitive data such as IP. Many, many types of data has to be just secured for a long period of time. So we have two elements. We have the hardware update cycle. We have the data shelf time. Also think about how long does it take you to migrate to safer solutions? The key challenge here is not that, that um, you know, one upgrade is, is difficult. The key challenge is that cryptography is everywhere. It's across applications. It's across databases. It's across hardware. 
it might be easy to to do the first couple of uh, of migrations, but then how do you think about everything else? How do you find the last ten percent? That would take a massive amount of time. And if we look in the past, we we can see that that previous migrations also took uh, typically ten year, fifteen year. Uh, for example, MD5 or DES or SHA-1, all of these migrations from older cryptography standards to newer typically just take a lot of time. And time is running out, so it's good to start early. So that means that there is a massive consequence eventually when quantum computers are there. Timelines are uh, maybe not as long as you think, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So depending on your application, you might want to start sooner. Um, and it might take a lot of time, right? So I think the key challenge is to find what parts of cryptography can we really find today that are the most sensitive, the most urgent, uh, and the most low-hanging fruit, perhaps, into starting this migration. Now, what we haven't really discussed is what can anything be done about this? Is this just something that is going to be a massive apocalypse, or can we actually uh, do something about it? And luckily, there is a lot of developments. A lot of people are thinking about what we can do about this challenge, how we can solve some of this. And there actually is a lot of technology available today that we can use to uh, address this challenge. Although some of the, the cryptography standards that we might want to employ to replace the, the older versions are still in development, and they might not be uh, standardized and secure, uh, we do know how they are going to look and feel like so we can start to test with them we can see how they perform we can see how they can be integrated into our solutions and we can integrate them in the larger stack so that's one thing we can do another thing we can do is to think about uh, crypto agility how can we build more agile systems where we have the ability to upgrade cryptography in a more efficient and managed way so that when these cryptography standards are uh, ready we have a much easier job of replacing them and there can be a whole range of solutions that we can think of to, uh, to, to increase agility. For example, we can think about um, certificates that employ both uh, the old version, the old cryptography, and the newer one. And we can just switch when the moment we need it. Or we can think about hardware that is both ready already as in, in terms of capacity and memory and compute power for the new cryptography. We can also think about our uh, discovery phase how do we know what cryptography you use where uh, and uh, and how uh, to inventorize our our assets in the next couple of years we will have to do this very regularly uh, both because of compliance uh, governments are requiring us to have a good view about what cryptography is uh, is used uh, but also really just to to have an efficient uh, transition so we can use tools that scan for example networks uh, to scan what type of cryptography is used. We can use tools to identify what the sensitivity of some of our cryptographic assets are. Uh, we can try to scan applications and, and discover um, uh, the, the sensitivity and the cryptography and the security of, of those elements. So I hope I gave a, a bit of an idea about that there is actually something we can do today, even though those standards aren't there yet. So I wanted to summarize what is uh, uh, what is the key points? So first of all, quantum computers are this new type of technology that can do amazing things uh, and have very significant impact in a number of fields, including material science, quantum chemistry, and potentially also finance and other areas. But also the other thing is that they break cryptography. And it might not be here today, but someday it will. It could be five years, 10 years, uh, but depending on the sensitivity and your application, you might want to think about it sooner. Um, and then there are things that you can do. There is tools available. There is um, uh, uh, there is uh, cryptography in preparation. So if you want to have a smooth migration, it's better to start thinking about it today. I want to thank you, and I hope you have a great day. <laughs>